I'm going to be brutally honest with you. There's a big problem with your code. You don't know it and your reviewers won't catch it. But at some point, it'll bite you anyway. Your types are too loose and they're causing problems. I don't mean basic mistakes like adding a string to an integer or calling a method on null. I'm talking about things that are usually considered business logic, not type system fundamentals, like adding kilometers to miles or maintaining tight access control. Believe it or not, these things can actually be solved at compile time using a static type system. And I'm going to show you how using phantom types. So what exactly are phantom types? A phantom type is a type parameter that appears in the definition of a data type, but is not used anywhere in the data structure, meaning it has no effect on the runtime representation of that type. For example, here we have a file type, which has a type parameter called status. You'll notice that we don't use this anywhere in files constructor, which only has a path and a set of permissions. We also have two types, open and closed, that don't have any constructors, which means they can't be constructed at runtime. However, we can still use them as phantom types. Consider a function to open a file. The function definition here states that the function parameter must be a closed file using the closed type as the type parameter for file. The function then returns an open file. Let's say we try to open the same file twice. On some systems, this would potentially cause a runtime error. However, thanks to our phantom types, this code doesn't even compile. And we can use the same trick on functions like read and write, guarding us from trying to perform operations on closed files. This is incredibly useful. And while I've shown you examples using Gleam here, you can apply this to many languages with generic types. Some, however, like Rust or TypeScript, don't like unused type parameters. So there are other steps to using phantom types. Rust, for example, has a phantom data type that you can use in your structs to get around this. Now that you hopefully understand a little more about what phantom types are, let's explore some more use cases, starting with unit tracking in scientific computing. Let's say you're working with distances of some sort. While the following code may compile, it has a massive logic error. The final distance is going to be wrong because we're adding miles and kilometers without doing any conversions. And while yes, in this case, the error is pretty obvious due to the variable naming, it's not always going to be this easy. And when you're working with formulae that are just a jumble of letters and symbols, it can get pretty messy. With an equation like this, how can we guarantee that any of the units are right? Phantom types, of course. Consider the distance example again, and let's add a new type, distance with miles and kilometers as phantom types, as well as some constructors and an add function to add distances. Although the constructor functions here technically have the same body, the type definitions make them distinct from each other. Now, when we try to run our code from earlier using distances with units, we get a compile error. And not only that, but we've been able to reduce the length of our variable names while still communicating the same amount of information. Maths is cool, but it might not be your jam. And that's fine. If you're more of a creative person or you just want to learn something new, you'd probably be interested in this video sponsor, Skillshare. I've talked about Skillshare before, as have many other creators. But if you don't already know, Skillshare is the world's largest online learning community for creatives. I see programming as a creative endeavor, and there are definitely programming classes on Skillshare, but there's also so much more like writing, design, and even music production. Skillshare has thousands of classes for you to choose from, often created by industry experts. Fancy something with a bit more progression? Check out Skillshare's learning paths, which take you deep on one specific topic. My resolution for 2025 is to try anything once, which is why I've been learning how to make fresh pasta using this course from the folks over at Italy. And as a thank you for watching my video, the first 500 people to join Skillshare using the link in the description will get their first month for free. So get cracking on those New Year's resolutions by picking up a new skill. But for now, let's get back to the video. The file and units examples were all well and good, but what about more day-to-day -day software engineering? Building CRUD apps and microservices and the like. Well, phantom types can be used here too. Let me show you a couple of examples of where I'm personally using them in the real world. At work, as you might expect, we have services that interact with a database. Anyone who's worked on a large enough project involving a database has probably seen at least one bug where a read, update, or delete has failed and given incorrect results because every table has an integer primary key and some IDs have gotten mixed up somewhere. We combat this at runtime using Stripe-like typed IDs, meaning our ID columns all have different prefixes and also have nice readable IDs for our users. Under the hood though, these are all just strings, so there's nothing stopping 
prompting us using the wrong ID when trying to read from the database and getting no results. Phantom types to the rescue once again. We use a custom resource ID type that has a generic parameter for the table, which is a phantom type. We can then use these in our data access layer to provide even better type safety when writing our queries. Secondly, I use phantom types in my Gleam framework Pevensey. If you've not heard of Pevensey, it's a backend application framework that currently provides auth and caching capabilities and has more features planned. To avoid restricting users to a particular tech stack, Pevensey uses an abstraction called a driver, allowing users to choose their backend for a particular Pevensey module. For example, you may choose to use Postgres with Pevensey auth and Redis with Pevensey cache, or you might choose to use SQLite for both. Importantly, Pevensey drivers have the concept of a connection status, which is enforced at compile time with phantom types. Logically, you can't fetch a user from your database if you don't have a database connection, but you might want to be able to choose between opening a new connection on every request or use the same connection for the lifetime of the program. This will ultimately depend on the driver you're choosing. Pevensey modules have a connected phantom type and drivers implement connect and disconnect functions. Other functions in Pevensey modules will then only accept a connected driver, meaning you can't use the wrong one, but giving users full control over their connection management strategy. With all this said, phantom types, unfortunately, are not a silver bullet and do have some drawbacks. Firstly, phantom types are so named because they don't exist at runtime, meaning you can't do any runtime operations on them. For example, you can't pattern match on a phantom type, meaning you couldn't have a catch-all add function for distances that handles conversions between units. You also need to be careful about users constructing types themselves. While in the distance case, it's perfectly fine to let users create their own distances, you might not want to let them create already open files. Also, in Gleam, you can't apply constraints to type parameters, so you can't enforce that your phantom type would always be a valid value. For example, this is perfectly valid user code. You can get around both of these by making your type opaque, so code outside of the module the type is defined in can't construct it, but you may not want that. It's up to you to decide when phantom types are likely to be useful in your code and when they might just get in the way. I've given you a few examples of how you can use phantom types in your code, but if you want to read up more on the topic, I'll link a fantastic article on the subject in the description. It's written by Gleam core team member Haley and is well worth the read. In the meantime, if you fancy learning more about Gleam as a language, I'll leave my impatient devs video for Gleam on the left of your screen. But YouTube thinks it knows better than me, as always, and it's suggesting the video on the right. The choice is yours. See ya!